Now, there's good and bad to knowing language, secondary and so forth, not primary. <laughs> Hope you know the primary language you're speaking. Um, but good and bad to knowing so much in great diversity is many times it's hard to bring something down to a simplified level without making it stupid. You know, there's, there's all kinds of language courses online. Some of them are for children. And some people learn that way. They're visual learners. You get pictures and you identify the picture with the word. You repeat the word a few times. Um, this case, because I feel many of you are familiar, you've been watching all these years, but I forget there are many people out there who are not familiar. So I toss around words. So please forgive me. Uh, I did this last lesson and probably when I did an introduction using words like declension and um, first and second declension nouns, it's an, almost an automatic assumption, which is erroneous on my part because not everybody knows what that means. So I had to take a couple of steps back and reel this back in a little bit. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, and hopefully this will make sense if you were listening when I did the first lesson. So, I think I've made this as simple as possible. Greek is a highly inflected language. And perhaps when I gave you the cases, I said kind of very generically, the nominative usually is subject of the sentence, genitive usually is representing possession, we Typically in English we would translate of, but um, these are very simplistic, basic concepts because in fact in each and every case there could be anywhere from five to ten subcases as you get more advanced. It, it almost becomes like, whoa, could there be that much in there? And there is. Um, we covered dative and accusative and so forth, so in, in terms of cases. But when I started talking about declension, um, and I, I kind of analogized it to, in other languages, what we call conjugation. True and not true. So I need to qualify a little bit. True when we get into the verbal forms. We're dealing with stems that have endings. True, because as you get into verbs that indicate time or their, for example, we, we've looked at just on Sunday, I touched on the present. Um, there are different uh, parts of the verb as we look at declension that will actually give it the sense of much like Eng English conjugation. However, dealing with the nouns, all the nouns are doing in, just like in the English language, a noun could be person, place, or thing, could also represent um, something that is an emotion or a state. And all we're doing right now is looking at the endings. If I were to make a comparison with English nouns to Greek nouns, the best example that I could take is out of the genitive. So in English, for example, when we're using something that is possessive, we might put an apostrophe to, to symbolize that this is, this is belonging to someone or it is of someone's pertaining to some person's possession of. When you're using the Greek language, you're using the case system. So really all you're doing and all we're looking at is the endings. In other words, the nouns themselves don't change, just the endings to signify, to tell us whether this noun is the subject of the sentence or is this noun showing us possession or is this noun showing us something about so it's really more 
when we're dealing with the nouns, it's really more about identifying how the noun is functioning within the sentence versus a verb that, now I'm going to use the taboo word to explain this, but versus a verb that in our English language is conjugated and changes in its aspect, in its activity. The noun does not. So what you end up having to do with the Greek, you either have a definite article or no article, or a definite article in the English, the. You either have the, but there is no a, which is indefinite. Your article and your noun must be in agreement. So if one is in the genitive, the other will be in the genitive. If one is singular, the other one will be in the singular. They agree with each other. But unlike a verb that is describing an action, past, present, future, subjunctive, imperative, these types of concepts, the noun is not. But the noun still is fitting within a case. So I had somebody ask me, well, can you translate the words that you did? In other words, I assumed immediately when that was said that that individual must have assumed that the nouns are appearing like verbs do. In other words, that they're changing when in fact they are not. And the only thing that's going to change is the ending on the noun to tell us what case the noun is in. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. Because so I wanted to make sure, I think that there might have been some confusion there. So when I mention first declension nouns, nouns that have a stem, much like any language, like we have stand in English, we might say that is the stem, and adding ing is how we move the word along. Here, stem, whatever the stem is, ending in either an alpha or eta are first declension, primarily feminine. That's simple. Nouns that have a stem ending in omicron are second declension and mostly masculine or neutral. If a stem ends in a consonant, it will become part of the third declension nouns. And what do you have to know about why we're calling these first, second, third? Just think of it this way. First, has the, the alpha or the eta, put that as one category. Second has the omicron, third consonant. So if you're looking at your stem, whatever the stem ends in will determine in which category it fits in, first, second, or third. Now there are nouns that are indeclinable in Greek. Those would be proper names or words that have been transplanted, they're not native to the Greek language, and therefore they cannot be, you, you, can't, you can't do anything with them, okay? Um, so let's take a look at my tablet, because what I try to do is simplify this thing here tonight. So what I've done here is I've got first and second declension. What are the first and the second? First, either ending in alpha or eta, second, ending in Omicron, right? So if you had a Greek noun ending in either of the two categories, we're looking at first and second declension, first in the masculine, then feminine, then neutral. And what I've done here is I've grouped the singular, nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative, and then the plural, whoops, the plural down below. Oh. And yes, the lines do erase. We found that out. All right. So, hypothetically, if we had, and we'll look, I'm going to give you a true example in a minute, but if you were looking, and th there's a reason why I have some asterisks here, because that is technically not exactly the way it appears, but I tried to simplify it for you. Um, but basically, you can see how, for example, let's take a look at the accusative. All the way, it is the same for the accusative singular. Likewise, the dative. So you don't really don't have a lot to memorize there. Likewise, if you look down at the plural, kind of interesting that um, genitive and dative, the endings are the same. 
throughout, masculine, feminine, neutral. So what you're looking at are probably the ones that, that are changing as the ones you probably want to get familiar with. Because the ones that don't, you just put in your brain. These are, they go straight through, masculine, feminine, neutral, and then you're done with it. So that's kind of the way I laid this out. Now, here's what I did for you. I think these are words you might recognize. And unfortunately, I tried to squeeze it all in so the writing is not that nice. But let's put a line right here that separates the singular up top and the plural down below. And I used for the masculine declension uh, the word logos, which you're familiar with, which means word. In the King James, it can be word with a small w, it can be word with capitalization. Um, the word, as John uses it, refers to Christ, so that word is familiar to us. And now take a look at the endings as they, remember I just showed you my previous chart which just had the endings. So here's what I want you to look at. And this is kind of interesting actually. I should uh, be clear about one thing. If you were looking for the stem this is a, it might be a little bit confusing because we've kind of been programmed here that the stem might be L. I'm using English letters now, L-O-G. But actually the stem for the noun is logo. Except for the dative, you can see where the O, and of course th these are your exceptions, um, but that's actually the stem, not L-O-G or, or I'm using English letters, it's easier. But you've got the O at the end, and that kind of gives you an idea. If you were initially digging on a lexical level, you'd want to know the stem of your word. So if you're going to go into a lexicon, be on Strong's. Now, here's where you've got to be really careful. Uh, virtually almost every textbook will just explain what I just did the way I did it, and that's right. However, I'm not sure that I have this book here. Maybe I do, and maybe I don't. Let's take a look. Let's see what goodies we have down here. Oh, here it is. Always all kinds of book disasters going on here. This is a Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature, third edition revised and edited by Frederick William Danker, based on Walter Bowers, who is the the Walter Bowers, right? So whatever that means to you. It may not mean a thing. Uh, <laughs> I just have some comedy about some of these things. All right. In this particular lexicon, we may actually have the logos listed as, and exactly that's what they do here. So, uh, Logos is listed as the, and you'll find most of the entries are nominative singular in the lexicon. I'm going to explain why I was mentioning root in a second. Nominative singular will be the entry, that's that first one at the top here, will usually be your entry in the lexicon. However, in this particular one, they have Logos, Logu and logo. And directly beside that, it says a verbal noun of lego. Now they're using the dative. Kind of interesting in the sense pick. And then, of course, you've got a whole bunch of definitions um, with scripture attached in this particular uh, underneath logos. You've got a communication whereby the mind finds expression, a word. I'll just read them to you briefly. Um, computation or reckoning, uh, the independent personified expression of God, the logos, and so on. But there are other lexical Greek tools where you will simply find the root. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that it may actually be Bowers, um, this fellow right here, if my memory serves me correct, that has 
has them broken down by stem with, you know, the stem, and the stem will occur, I'm not quite sure if it's Bowers. I'll next, next time I come, I'll bring in and I'll show you. It will have L-O-G and hyphenation um, or extension to show the endings that may exist. So it's listed in that way lexically without the O. But technically, you can always find your uh, stem by going back to the table I previously showed you. So these are your endings that get attached, whether you are in first or second declension, to remember what those endings were, whatever the noun ends in, first and second declension. So you'd want to look at what comes before, typically, that will be the identifier. And that kind of helps to figure out the stem. So that's, that's what we have there. Let's go back to that page we were just at. Now I've also included a feminine noun, graphe, which is right. It could be in a verbal form or scripture, often as it's used in, in the uh, Bible. We get our English word, by the way, from graphic, graphic design, graphics, right? So if you were to l go down this basically and take a look at why um, the endings are, it's always important to identify. Um, we had one table in the previous, sorry, I got to do this to you, I got to go back. Um, take a look at this. That dash means it, there's just nothing there, right? Which is why, now back to, you're going to see there's nothing here. Um, but if you go through the entire um, feminine declension, you'll see the pattern. So I just, I put this up because after putting that first chart up, it kind of gives you an idea of the endings. It's not as bad as Hebrew. Hebrew is torturous, right? This is not as bad. I, you kind of look at it and go, ah, okay, I could deal with it. Now, if you, you were listening at home. If you didn't do Hebrew, then you're saying, huh? But if you went through Hebrew, you're like, huh, Hebrew was hell. This is nothing. <laughs> so I just want you to see the pattern. And of course, the neutral here of the word ergon, which is work. Um, and many words that could accompany it. But just that kind of gives you a paradigm. So you can see first and second declension. That's all I want to do tonight, first and second. And we'll tackle third because I, I, I will want to, as I told you, I wanted to slow this down. I didn't want to be dumping that much information. Um, so this is a little bit more palatable if we're just going to go what you need to know piece by piece. This is a little bit more palatable. Let me just check and see if there was something here that I needed to tell you more. Okay, so someone might ask the question, um, just to make sure that I don't leave anybody out of the equation tonight. So if these are not treated, we mistake the fact that the endings change to suggest that it might be like a verb, where a verb has movement. This is why we have the case. So you've always got to come back to it's a noun. Person, place, thing, state, perhaps, um, state, of, state of mind or emotion could even be described with a noun, but just not in momentum or movement. However, because of the case system in the Greek, you're immediately guaranteed to know a few things about the noun you're dealing with. Like, in the Greek, word order is important. So many times, the word that the, the order of the words may not be as we think, but probably the emphasis will be on the first or second word that appears. Usually, it will not be that the if the first word is a definite article, then obviously we're looking at the noun. 
That will be the emphasis there. So what's important to note is that if we were looking at my paradigm and looking at the word logos, we would know automatically, if you just kind of scan this first blush and you had this paradigm somewhat memorized, looking at the fact that logos has the ending just like that, the sigma ending, the first thing you would automatically know is that is typically going to signify the subject of the sentence. So this may seem a little strange what I'm going to tell you. Many English speakers, native English speakers, are not that proficient at their language. You learn it when you're so young and then you just speak it and it's, it's autopilot. The wonderful thing about this language is if you learn the paradigm, you can immediately look at something and know without knowing too much what you're dealing with. So if we were talking regarding, let's say, the genitive, and we have here logu, and we were putting this into a sentence, we know that this would be essentially a word that maybe someone had spoken, the word that proceeded from somebody. Um, so it's just, it's, it's a visual identification of the parts of the speech. In many ways, think of it as color coding when you're looking at the language and it's much easier to identify parts of speech in Greek than it is in English. You might say, hmm? well, if you're proficient in English, no. But if you're not proficient in English, yes. Because all you've got to do is memorize the paradigm to know, uh-huh, see this right here tells me this is dative. And if we go back to the grammar box, the grammar box kind of tells us nominative, I'm nominating myself as the subject, right? Genitive is what proceeds out, out of, or from. That is, from the box, it could be it's going out of the box. Dative is in the box. Accusative is pointing towards the box. And we talk about dative. There's a little mnemonic device that says to, T-O, or four, but it's done like this. Two or four, the number two or four people go out on a date. That's how you'll remember two, T-O, and F-O-R as the equivalents, not exactly, but English equivalent to dative. If we had a noun and we were building something around the noun, that is, you went to Johnny's house, except our structure is different. We don't have the case system, as the Greek does, to kind of, as you can see, just merely identify what's going on. So I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if this will make sense to you, but uh, let's go back to the nominative for a second. So in the English, in terms of English language, we'd say the ball broke the window. It almost sounds Spanish, doesn't it? Uh, the ball is the subject of the word, of the sentence, and of the verb broke. It has nominated itself as the subject, right? This is doing the same thing, except you really don't need to know too much except looking at the paradigm. And then you begin to, as you begin to read and study Greek, you'll encounter these words and you'll immediately say, that's nominative. That's the subject right there. Okay? Um, to identify what we would normally, the questions we would ask to identify the subject of the sentence, we would normally be asking who or what. Those are the questions. So if you were wanting to kind of put some devices, little kind of helps for identifying the subject, it's going to be who or what. And put that as a bridge to the nominative, because these are their concepts just to help as an aid. And as you advance, then you realize it's not as simple as that, but this is the, the simplified, broken down. Accusative 
If a word has, if, if we're talking about a direct object, um, we would be asking the questions what or whom. And again, it's just helping to identify parts of speech in the case that they occur. So the noun is the noun and it won't change. And the only thing that is changing is the endings, inflection or declension. Okay. So, and I've discussed the genitive already. So pretty much that gives you the flavor of the basic first and second. I'm not even going to do the third tonight. We're going to leave that alone. But I did put together just a few words, and they're good for you to jot down because you've seen them before. I picked familiar words. You've seen them before. So, anthropos. And if you were to put these through your, um, your paradigm, you might have some interesting situations to contend with. So anthropos, just for your information, this word occurs 550 times in the New Testament, meaning man, mankind, humankind, human being, or person. This is just building a small vocabulary. Theos, by the way, our English word anthropology comes from anthropos. Theos, of course, theological, right? God. Occurring 1,317 times, and I'm doing this for a reason. I'm trying to show you familiar words in the Greek. Unlike other languages, there are 5,437 different words in the New Testament. And those words their reoccurrence form a total of something like somewhere close to 140,000 words. So when you think about it, you've got a lot of words that are reoccurring. For example, the word chi, which is and, I think occurs 9,100 and, I don't know, 30 some odd times. So if you were making a pie chart and figuring out how many words you actually have to learn, or not that many. That's what's kind of cool about doing a small vocabulary, just jotting it down somewhere. And then you're now going to start looking up words at some point. And you say, oh, yeah, I, I know that word. I've seen it before. And then suddenly when you start looking up words or you start looking into the Greek New Testament, you're going to see these words occur more and more until the words are actually in your head. And then you begin to know that there are different words like we have the King James says, behold, or to look. Idu or blepo, there's at least four different Greek words that are conveying sometimes one English word. So these are just kind of a little fun tidbits, but they're vocabulary builders for you. So jot them down. Cosmos, 186 times. Kurios, which can also be kurio if it was in the genitive, right? We were talking about a genitive structure which is Lord, Master, and sometimes even, we'll read in the King James, Sir. I don't know how they came to that, but okay. 717 times. Christos, Greek for Christ, 529 times. Jesu, Jesus, but also the Greek for uh, Joshua as well. But in the New Testament, we have this occurring 917 times. Evangelion, or ooh, depending, I put the genitive endings there as a possibility as well, 76 times. And the word pistos, which could also have a variety of, we'll put open endings, 67 times. Don't go looking for, you know, people confuse the verb. There are many multiple forms of this word of its root in verbal or 
nominal noun form. So don't, not to be confused. Um, so th this is the beginning of your vocabulary. And I'm, I'm, I probably won't give you a word count every time, but just to show you that you're going to encounter these words a lot. Then there are other smaller words that are particles and parts of speech, like I use the word kai, which is also or and, um, katho, in, ice, epi. All of those are you know, thousand, two thousand. They occur multiple times. So it's almost like once you master uh, the basics, you can start reading. And a wonderful way to start reading, just so you know, the key with this is to give you the tools just kind of like, it's like training wheels, and I want you to go, right? <laughs> Let's move on. The wonderful thing about this is if you have a Greek uh, New Testament, I'll start first with this. This is the probably the most challenging of all. Now, this is a Nestle Allen, Greek English. So you've got Greek on the one side and English on the other. And you've got a lot of different, in this particular uh, book, you've got, if there is, if it still is in here, which it may not be, there should be a little piece of paper, the legend, uh, which helps you out with all of the strange notations at the bottom, usually referring back to um, a variant reading in a papyri or a manuscript. So you can go to this to kind of decode what's down there. It's like being a detective. You use this little deal to look down there and kind of identify if it says, for example, um, P13. You might want to look up, okay, P13 is such and such a manuscript, or it'll give you a whole bunch of information that if you're really wanting to pursue it, you could try and pursue it. But I'm pretty confident that this uh, this particular Nestle Allen, uh, they did their homework really good. So the notations are rock solid at the bottom. If you were wanting no variant readings or something of ancient texts, wonderful to practice simply taking the page that is completely in Greek, page at random, not in order because some of you have the scriptures, you know, oh yeah, I know what John 6 is, I know what John 7 is, or Matthew 3. So it, that becomes a cheat. But just at random, taking one page and trying to go through and see if you can recognize any of the words. And it's very interesting because as you progress, you'll go through and you'll say, okay, I, I see, I recognize this word, and I recognize this word, and it suddenly becomes easy. But in the beginning, you won't maybe recognize a lot of them. So you go through and you see what you know, the things you're familiar with, gar, for, or I'm looking right here. I actually have it open to Hebrews 3, and I'm looking down. I see gupto dia museos, Egyptian through Moses. And I keep reading, and I can you know, piecemeal it together. But the places, if I didn't know the word, I could immediately take my strongs, and because now I have my help of the alphabet, I can go and look it up. And the strongs is obviously in alphabetical order. Look it up in the Greek, and at least get an idea. OK, that word means that. So that's almost like a good way to you know, forget about dipping your toe in the water. That's a plunge uh, to get you started. And not to worry about mastery of declension or inflection at this point, because the whole purpose is once I lay out how the article works with the noun, and really, once we get to the verbs, everything else kind of fits itself in place nicely, because the rest of the things that we haven't learned, such as adjectives and adverbs, you'll also see they must be in agreement. If one thing is dative, that is in agreement with another, it must be dative. If it's singular, it must be singular. So you, you're always having structure that agrees with itself um, to convey complete meanings. And um, it's almost like once you've crossed the hurdle that this is an interesting way to understand language. As I said, looking at the paradigm, recognizing that that first line I put 
logos, nominative, means subject of the sentence. We will encounter a different concept in the verbs, but with the same cases, except now we're adding, we're going to be adding time, we're going to be adding different dimensions to bring the verb to something that either is our worst in the past, maybe it's something having to do with, you know, we'll talk about this, the type of time in which it occurs, um, past, present, future, uh, if it's reoccurring, but we'll still be using the case system. So it's important that you at least master what the case itself represents. So remember, nominative, hey, I want to be the subject, right? I'm, I'm doing that as if to say that's your, your help. Genitive, think of the source, of. Not everything is going to be straightly translated of, but this is the book of God. Probably a bad genitive, but it, you get the idea. Uh, also possessive, by the way. Uh, the dative case, where we might talk about a sentence structure which will occur often in, uh, in the New Testament, in Christ. And you'll probably find a dative there when it's referring to us being in Christ. Uh, and of course, the accusative, which is always pointing the finger at and towards the box. Uh, we're talking about direct object for the dative to and for. So all of these helps to figure out this is what happens with the nouns, but the nouns themselves are not, they're not moving like verbs. They remain, I give a descriptive of something, the book, the book, a definite article with the noun, is read, and I've just given you an adjective to describe the book, and the book hasn't moved. So if the book was the subject of the sentence in the Greek, we'd be looking at the nominative case. Does that help clarify that the nouns are not functioning like verbs, even though they have their ends change? Claro? See? Si? Kind of? Okay. We'll repeat this. No worries. Okay. <laughs> if you are inclined to get... There's all kinds of tools out there. Um, this actually is the uh, new revised standard, which I often use. And it's using the UBS fourth edition, which is not this one, but Nestle Allen for its Greek text. So if you're going to get a Greek something, I would recommend if you're starting out, do this one thing. Do not get a Greek English with King James, which is what a lot, a lot of times people want to do. And the reason why I'm telling you not to do that is because if you get yourself a Greek and English with either an NIV or some, now you've, you've actually got a secondary English source right at your fingertips of something you're going to be using often. And I'm not suggesting that the text of the New Revised Standard is my favorite, but it always gives me an option in translation so that I can kind of think a little bit outside of the King James box. And then, now I'm going to make full circle. Because after you begin to translate and do your own translating work, you'll go back to the wonderful 26th translation and realize how some got to where they got in the diversities of their understanding of the New Testament text, how they perceived it. Well, you say, well, isn't a genitive a genitive? No. We're learning the basics, but, and it's not, don't just think, oh, I heard Dr. Scott or Pastor Scott say objective genitive or subjective genitive, because those are only two out of a score of possibilities when we're dealing with the real intense grammar of genitive that could occur. And that's way advanced, so you know, if you stick around for that, We'll be probably counting hairs on the table that you've pulled out. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but at least we have a good start tonight, and this is a good, simple start.